What she does become is the political secretary of the Countess of Warwick, hence my quotes that I started with. And the Countess of Warwick um, purchases a London flat, which she sets up as a salon um, um, and in which Mary lives. And the two of them campaign on a number of issues that, um, that represent a continuation of her early work, earlier work on the school board. She's heavily involved in campaigns around the establishment of open-air recovery schools that were targeted at the treatment of tuberculosis. Um, it was thought that you could ident it was possible to identify a pre-tubercular child who would be sent to one of these institutions. I'm smiling with cynicism here. The prevailing view was that fresh air was good and that was what would help treat, you know, uh, perhaps cheaper than al al altering housing conditions, but still. Um, but open air schools were seen as the way forward and she was actually involved in the establishment of the first of those um, institutions in this country that opened um, for a brief period in the summer of 1907 in the Bostel Woods on land that was all owned by the Royal Arsenal Cooperative Society and again her involvement has largely been written out of the record other than the records that were kept by the Cooperative Society and they do talk about and if you go to their archive they had a huge press cutting file full of uh, materials relating to this brief experiment. Sadly the weather was bad. It was, it was thought that um, pine woods were particularly good sites for for these kinds of institutions and the first one of its kind of the kind was established actually in Germany or in the outskirts of Berlin and Charlottenburg in the pine woods there um, but um, the weather was appalling but there are images that have survived again one of them is going round it's the children at Bostelwood that you see sitting in the deck chairs on the woods there so she was involved in that, continuing the campaigns for school meals, continuing campaigns to prevent child labour, to continuing campaigns to see the medical inspection of school children. She also becomes the education spokesperson for the Marxist Social Democratic Federation in this period. And it's she that um, is influential in persuading the Countess of Warwick that this is the socialist group that she should join. Now, just to give you a sense, you may well be wondering what about Lady Warwick's conversion to socialism. I don't know at all. Um, Lady Warwick, I began by talking about her and describing her as the most beautiful woman in England, which she was, um, in, in this period, she was attributed as having been. She was also the wealthiest heiress of her time and had independent money, but marries into the Warwick family based at Warwick Castle, clearly. And she was uh, well known um, for her long-term affair with, the, with Edward VII, um, then um, the Prince of Wales. And she was described as babbling brook for her so-called indiscretions. That's what, how the press sort of depicted her. Um, but she had a luxurious lifestyle. And in 1895, she threw this spectacular ball, um, fancy dress where people are, uh, uh, um, you know, attended in all kinds of attire. Um, the setting was supposed to be the court of uh, Marie Antoinette. Um, and this attracted the ire of a socialist journalist named Robert Blatchford, who was um, editor of the Clarion newspaper. And he did this feature, um, picking out and, and, and you know, um, castigating the money spent on this event. She responded by going down to his offices and he gave, and she appears to have took, a three-hour lecture on the labour theory of value. Now, I'm not suggesting that this was an overnight conversion. She'd also been influenced by concerned social commentators of the time, including journalists like W.T. Stead, who actually went down with the Titanic ship in, I can't think of the date, date the Titanic went down, but Stead <laughs> perished along with some of those other men on board the Titanic. Um, but he was publicising a number of social issues at the time, including what was then described as the white slave trade. Now, um, her early um, initiatives in relation to social concerns, she was a local poor law guardian, and she actually escorted the Prince of Wales round Warwick Workhouse, which was her responsibility, to try and awaken his interest in social questions. She um, 
Her recent biographer says that in terms of her socialism, that her, um, it's, you know, she it was strongest in the field of education. And just to give you a sense of the philanthropic um, involvement, and she established three institutions. She, I mean, by the end of her life, her for fortune is virtually gone. She spends huge amounts of money in the socialist cause, but amongst which she set up a school for needlework, to teach needlework to women. She set up a co-educational technical school, and she also set up the, an agricultural college for women at Reading. Um, so she's spending a lot of money, um, and I do think she deserves a, um, a kind of you know, a nuanced reflection on her contribution as a socialist, while some people have been very dismissive, but there is no doubt of her commitment in terms of the money that she was spending. So it's, it's this um, patronage that facilitates um, Mary's activism at this moment in time. So she's, the Countess is a political secretary, the two are campaigning, in the 1906 general election, they target every single constituency at which there's a Labour Party candidate contesting the seat, and they carry the message of free school meals, improved education, and medical inspection at all of those seats. And the 1906 general election is significant in terms of thinking about Labour movement politics, because this is the moment when you get the return of a significant number of Labour MPs for the first time. She says that she was writing policy documents for the trade union as, at this time, and when her son was interviewed by W. E. McCann, w. P. McCann for his PhD thesis, which um, was completed in 1960, he said that his mother had become what he described as the educational mentor of trade unionism. She says she's, part, she's drafting the trade union resolutions on education and that she also drafted the Labour Party's Education Provision of Meals Bill, which Will Thorne presented in Parliament in spring 1906. Just to recap, it gives you a sense of the demands that she was wanting to put forward. That bill sought full public control of all state schools, free secular state education from the primary school to the university. It sought a generous system of non-competitive maintenance scholarships that would be funded by the granting of money and, crucially again, the restoration of what they saw as the misappropriated educational endowments. So again, she's highly active, clearly, in, at this moment in time. She is also asked by the Deptford branch of the Social Democrats to contest that division at the London County Council elections that are due to take place in 1910. Women had won the right to contest county council elections in 1907. She, um, at the time of stepping forward, she accepts the nomination, but within the Social Democratic Party at the time, the party itself is divided on the issue. We're thinking about the lead up to the First World War, and they're split on the question of national defense. And she opposes the very jingoistic stance that's being taken by the leadership. And so she actually leaves the party and pulls out of the elections. Had she won that election, she would have been the first socialist councillor on the London County Councillor. But she doesn't fight and she never ever serves as an elected member again. In terms of thinking about Mary's position on the suffrage, Mary support the suffrage question, Mary supported adult suffrage. And rather than being actively involved in the women's movement's campaigns of the time, she still prioritises fighting, and this is a quote, she talks about the need to fight in the field of education. So again, it's very much with that William Morris's notion of making socialists that she concentrates on. So I'm now going to move on to my um, last but one section on independent working class self-education. Um, and to pick up on some of the issues that she's involved in there within the field of education, you've got a sense of the kind of position that she's taking with regards to the state school system. She is describing them as pe the people's schools in her uh, rhetoric, in her published writings, 
and she wants to see them as, as improved as, as best as can be at that moment in time. She also increasingly moves towards thinking about alternative substitutional or supplementary educational provision. In the context of the years leading down to the First World War, she supported a strongly political and agitational conception of adult education, identifying a distinctively socialist or working class curriculum. And her position is epitomized within the splits that then take place in 1909 at Ruskin College. Ruskin College was the Labour College that was established in Oxford in connection with the Labour movement and um, there were simmering issues right from the start around its position, concerns expressed in terms of with regard to the closeness of the links between Ruskin, the Labour College and Oxford University as a whole and also Ruskin and the concerns around Ruskin being linked to debates about the liberal educational philosophy that was espoused by the Workers' Educational Association. Mary opposes um, the kinds of education that um, she associates with the WEA, and she also supports the militant worker students who go on strike at Ruskin College in 1909 around the issues of um, popular control and around the question of the kind of nature that the curriculum should take. One of the questions, the particularly pertinent points that was made was how should economics be taught? And the militant workers and students and Mary thought that this should have a Marxist slant and they also wanted to see the teaching of sociology. Um, so that was um, sort of a shorthand, sort of a part of the nub around some of the debates that were going on within Ruskin. One of the issues that particularly concerned Mary and her supporters was anything that they saw as diluting the wider case that was still being articulated around the, what they defined as the misappropriation of those educational endowments. And they didn't want to see any further state funds diverted towards the support of provision like the adult education classes that were being um, provided by the Workers' Educational Association. And so she and her supporters were particularly worried by things like Albert Mansbridge's calls. Mansbridge was the man who was associated with the founding of the Workers' Educational Association. His calls for the, for the establishment of a royal commission on universities worried them, as did the um, production of a report on Oxford and working class education. They, they, the militant view was very much of education for the class struggle. Mary's heavily involved in the articulation of that view and a strong supporter right from the start of the organisation that the minority, that the militants formed, the Plebs League, and the establishment of the Central Labour College, which they go on to set up in London's Earl's Court. The target initially in much of this um, agitation, really it would be fair to say had been working men. She wants to broaden that to include provision for the training and educating of potential women who would contribute to the fight for socialism and hence her um, agitation around and desire to establish the equivalent for the, of the Central Labour College for men, for women. And she establishes Babel House, deliberately named after August Babel, the person who wrote, the German socialist who wrote one of the first books about the position of women under socialism. And a number of the tributes that have been going round are from fellow pleb leagues on the loop from fellow plebs leaguers who talk about her vigorous agitation on their behalf. One of the women who um, spent time at Babel House was a woman named Ethel Carney, who'd been a former mill worker and achieved a national standing in her lifetime. So I'm thinking now the years running down to World War I she gave up mill work and actually made a living initially out of socialist journalism and subsequently out of the writing and publishing of poetry, children's stories and novels, um, in one of which was called On Slavery and has an amazing frontispiece that's a real indictment of the capitalist system. But she, like um, Mary, is very forthright in those indictments. 